Alright, you can go whenever you're ready. Don't sound so excited. I am fine. Alright, wake up. I am Adora, He-Man's twin sister and defender of the Crystal Castle. This is Spirit, my beloved steed. Fabulous secrets were revealed to me the day I held aloft my sword and said, For the honor of Grayskull! Few others share this secret. Among them are Light Hope, Madam Raz, and Cowl. Together, we and my friends of the Great Rebellion strive to free Etheria from the evil forces of Horda. Hello and oh Jesus, that's not how we do that. All right. <laughs> <laughs> introduced us as Cinema Geeks. <clears throat> All right. Ha. Don't wait for us. I have a feeling we're going to be a while. Hello, this is Optimus Solo, and welcome to the 67th chapter in our Powers of Grayskull series. With me for this journey into the Masters of the Universe franchise, as usual, is TFG and Mike. Hello. Hello, this is the penultimate episode of Season 1 of... Myths of Etheria. True that. And are you ready for more Myths of Etheria on that note? This episode today? Sure, why not? All right. So in this episode, since you bring it up, of Myths of Etheria, we'll be giving you our thoughts on episode 61, Dark Smoke and Fire, episode 62, Magic Cats, and episode 63, Flowers for Hordak. So we hope you're ready, because it's time to go back to Etheria. Where's Smokey the Bear when you really need him? Anywhere! 
We start today with episode 61, Dark Smoke and Fire, with an air date of Friday, November 29th, 1985. Written by J. Michael Straczynski, Modulok has built a rocket specifically to disrupt the gateway between Etheria and Eternia that Shira and he use to go back and forth. Adora ends up a thousand years in Eternia's past. There, she meets Granimir the Dragon and his ally, King Tarbin. We have Hordak, Imp, and Majulak. We have She-Ra, Spirit, Light Hope. And then we have some people from Eternia's past, like Tarbin, Granimir, Slotty, Nazgal, Brightstar, and some various other villagers and dragons. What do you think of this time-traveling episode of She-Ra? I have to ask again, because it just bears repeating... Where the hell do you get these descriptions? Because I could have sworn... I'm like, the whole episode, I'm waiting for fucking He-Man to show up. Because <laughs> all as I saw in the description when I first looked at it before I watched the episode was She-Ra and He-Man. And I'm like, okay, cool, a crossover. Yeah, no, it's not. A, it is kind of... It's a pseudo-crossover. But I'm like... By the end, I'm like, damn, no He-Man. <laughs> okay. I kind of like that they did it without him. No, yeah, I know it's it's. Fu- I'm not saying it's bad that they didn't have him. I'm saying that I was half expecting him to show up at some point. Ah, you and your speed reading. <laughs> so, but what did you think uh, about the, the time travel aspect in that? No, I like it. I think it's great. Uh, technically, we see a much younger, much happier Granimir because when we first met him, he was a grumpy old bastard of a dragon. He didn't right. want to do with anything with humans. So traveling a thousand years into Eternia's past, we actually get to see Granimir when he's kind of young, happy, and chipper about humans. Right. I thought that was um, a clever way to kind of do that and show the evolution yeah. of his character. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, Some, interesting. Somebody was paying attention this time. And interesting also to see the the kind of the former Eternia in his past. I. I, I Maybe would have even liked a few more nods to things that would have later come to pass. Like, right? Not that anybody's going to be around a thousand years ago, but maybe some type of weird type of connection to something that we know about. I guess Granimir is the closest they can come to because he's about one of the only things that would have been alive in both yeah. time periods. But, uh, but I mean, like, okay, so the, okay, he's the only thing. He's the only living thing that would have been alive. You mean to tell me that Grayskull wasn't around a thousand years That's what I'm ago? Just something, just something. You know, just, the yeah, sorceress yeah, or somebody might have still been around or something. Yeah. There might have been some land. She was lying. I mean, I know we're not to whispering wood moment yet, but I do like she was lying. Wait, that's not the palace, like. <laughs> right. <laughs> it's hilarious. Yeah, for sure. Um, so I mean, I, I, I dig the the time aspect. I dig uh, most time travel stories in my cartoons, fantasy, sci-fi movies, whatever it might be. I, I'm a fan of time travel. A lot of times it's done poorly and causes a lot of uh, confusion and frustration out of people. But uh, on the surface, okay, so, go ahead. So, so, well, you, well you, you bring up a good point. And Granamere also brings up this point that she traveled through time and space. Like the gateway when it got when the the horde rocket knocked it off its course, she went through a different dimension. She went through a different time and actual space. People, seriously, I don't care how many people are Doctor Who fans. Listen to Doctor Emmett L. Brown. God damn it! Only deal with time travel because dealing with time and space travel, it's just too. Yeah, even Granimir can't handle that. So. Yeah, see? (laughs) All right, well, we're going to take a quick break. When we come back, we're going to be talking about our favorite Whispering Woods moments and if there are any bad moments from this time travel trip back into the past. Ladies and gentlemen, Morris Day in the motherfucking time. (laughs) What?
some ride. The question is, where am I? This looks like Eternia, but it's different somehow. That's the right sun, though. And that looks like King's Hill over there. The royal palace should be just on the other side. Maybe I'm in luck after all. I just can't wait to see the royal palace. It's it's not here. The palace is supposed to be right here. Get him! Get the rotten dragon lover. Don't let him get away. Hmm. Maybe she rock and even up the odds of it. Body Now's our chance while he's knocked out. Now that doesn't seem very fair. And who are you? The name is Shira, and I'm new around here. At least I think I am. New or not, if you're on his side, then you're against us. Grab her! My, but you are a friendly bunch, aren't you? <laughs> See you escape now. All right, if you insist. <laughs> hey, hey, hey. Ooh. Oh. Quickly, back to the village. We'll get Nazgal. He'll take care of them. What have I gotten myself into this time? Oh. No. Uh-oh. A dragon. Uh-oh. Something tells me it's going to get awfully hot around here. There she is, just like I told you. All right, we find ourselves in the Whispering Woods for the first time today. TFG and Mike, what did you like about Dark Smoke and Fire? That time warp was very cool. We normally don't see how they travel when going through the gates. We only see them going in and coming out of the gates. Uh, so it was interesting to see what is actually, like, you know how the the middle section of that works you know what i'm talking about right. so we only see the normally we'll you know we'll get to a scene where skeletor has a gate open and he's gonna get to grayskull but we only see him actually walk through it and then we'll see him appear on the other side we don't see how he gets in between so that's what i liked about shira and then uh about about this episode of Shira, and then she's like, whoa, oh, 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 no. <laughs> just, I love that. I thought Melendi did a great job with that on the voice acting with the reaction of after it got destroyed by the rocket. Uh, I love, obviously, love, love, love seeing Granamere. Um, I love the fact that Shira knows of him. Right. Because she's never... I, She's only heard stories of the guy. She's never actually met him, and I just love his surprise on his. You know me, <laughs> you know, and then and and then he uses his 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 you know, technically, really seriously. I should throw a Stan Bush song in here because Granamere has the touch in this episode. Uh, haven't we seen the two villains before? This isn't a bad. This, I'm not jumping into Whisper Fright Zone here, but I swear I've seen the the little midget orange dude. Slotty. Yeah, um, we've seen these two before. I've sw I swear I've seen that design. We definitely, uh, so we've definitely seen that because when I saw that too, I immediately recognized it. So yeah, I'm, I recognized it, but I didn't remember from where. 
I don't know if he appeared in one of those episodes or not. I'll have to we'll have to do some some research because I definitely know him from somewhere. But um, from what I can tell, he does not. Uh, he did not show up in uh, in He Man. Oh wait, it's it's the it's may not be his specific character, but it is that design. It was the guy who showed up and tricked one of the kids in He Man to doing something with a crystal or something or other. I remember it now. I just so they don't just remember. Used the same design before. Yeah, it's a it's an it's an animation. It, it's a character reuse. It's a character mo- It's a yeah. It's a character animation model re- reuse. Um, because I remember him flying around and, and tricking somebody into doing something. Maybe it was even Orko. I don't know. I just know I've seen that goddamn design somewhere <laughs> in he Man. Well, Folks, uh, we've been doing the show for four, almost five years. We're losing our minds at this point. Well, if somebody knows the character we're talking about, they're going to have to point him out. Because I've scanned through all of the uh, characters that appeared in He-Man. And it's not in there. If he had a speaking role, he would have been on the page. Because I've been adding all those as we go through so i don't know if uh where he would have appeared but uh, i was curious too of some of the dragons but none of the dragons uh showed up either none of the dragons but the the villain guy yeah i know who you're talking about slotty and and naz nazgar what's his name nazgal (laughs) nazgal (laughs) <laughs> but uh no neither that one of those gal's got a huge nas yeah but neither one of those showed up in he-man so um but i did definitely recognize slotty too when, when i first saw him as like a minion of somebody that i've seen maybe before. it was earlier in shira i don't know like i oh god it's gonna bug the crap out of me now because <laughs> oh, i've seen that damn design before in filmation and it wasn't some it was one of these two shows well, fans, you'll have to you have to chip in and let us know, yeah, where we've seen this before. So, any other um, Whispering Woods moments that you had? No. What about you? Well, I just had a, a couple. I love time travel. All right. Obviously, we rated very highly most of the Grand Amir episodes from He Man, so that is a good sign. Um, I always like when this show does fire as far as the shading and like the right. flickering and the shimmering. I think they did a real good job. It was almost ahead of their time when they were doing that. And at least for once, when we got our physical She-Ra moment, at least the the physics somewhat could be believable because she puts out the fire with wind. Yeah. Which is much better than some other versions that we've seen happen in the past. Yeah. No water, no heart, no earth, just, just wind. Right. So I, I dug that. And like I said, I really liked that not only did we get time travel, not only did we get Granamere, but like we were talking about in the other section there, that we got somewhat of an evolution of his character where we basically get to see beforehand. I thought maybe that they would go the route of even showing why he ended up hating humans so much or why he becomes this grumpy, grumpy dragon that we see later on. We didn't quite get that, but it still is cool to kind of see the before and after. And Yeah, because... What we've seen it to this point is we saw how grumpy he was, and then He Man and Men in Arms kind of, you know, changed him a little bit, saying, "Hey, not all humans are like that." And then, you know, he was up and bright and chipper, and now, you know, going into this, watching this, all as I could really remember off the top of my head was that very first episode where he was, you know, Rah, fire, destroy, you know, all that shit because he didn't want to talk to anybody, right? So. So, yeah, I really kind of dug that aspect of it, and it made for an interesting episode uh, overall. Did you have any uh, moments as far as getting into the Fright Zone? Nope. Fright Zone's empty this time. It is empty for me as well. So PSA was something about not telling the lies. Don't pass uh, the blame. That's what it is. Don't pass the blame. I, I don't know. It's Take so ownership weird. For, your, uh, for your actions. Yeah. yeah. The main it's... idea there, so... I think I think Lou Scheimer is uh, dipping into the mask of PSAs there, even though they're two different companies. I mean, at least it had something to do with the damn episode, I guess. That's true. <laughs> <laughs> so, very true. All right, we're going to take a quick break. When we come back, we're going to be seeing if anybody is worthy of Horde Bat's protection swords and how high or low we rate Dark Smoke and Fire. Well, how about that? They know each other. Are you all right? You hit your head pretty hard. Uh, I'm all right. 
And I heard enough to know that it was you who saved me from the others. I... I didn't know. I thought I was trying to protect you from her. And I was trying to protect him from you. Oh, this is so embarrassing. Well, no harm done. <laughs> Not yet, but there will be soon. <laughs> Still, it isn't safe here. You are welcome to come with us to Dragon Valley. All right. Perhaps I can find someone there who can answer a few questions. <laughs> That's Dragon Valley down there. Oh, wisest of dragons, are you here? Hi, I am here. Branamir? You know me? We've never met, but I've heard of you from He-Man, Orko, King Randor, Man-at-Arms. I do not know any King Randor, or Man-at-Arms, or anything called an Orko. I don't understand. Neither do I. But what the mind does not understand, magic may reveal. Let me see your thoughts, your friends, your enemies. Yes. I have seen all that I need. I have your answer. You were traveling to Eternia through a dimensional gate that went out of control. Yes, that's right. And you have reached Eternia. But this is the Eternia that existed a thousand years before you were born. You mean, I've traveled in time? A thousand years? Can you send me back? I am afraid that even my magic is not yet that powerful. It may well be that you will be trapped here in the past forever. All right, it's time for Horde Bats and Protection Swords. I'll let you go first, sir. What did you like or dislike enough to award something with? No Horde Bats. Nothing was bad enough to give a horde bat to. Okay. Uh, protection swords for Shira and Granamir because they were just awesome in the episode. I will echo you for Granamir and give him a double dose of a protection sword. He doesn't need them, but he can have two of them. <laughs> um, yeah, I thought he was fantastic. I liked seeing this different, younger version of him, so I was all about that. And kind of overall thoughts on the episode, sir, and then what would you rate it? Overall, okay, so one thing we didn't bring up earlier is when he figures out how to get her home. Mm -hmm. I thought that was really cool of them teaming up their powers. And then she asks him, do I have control of the gate? And I'm like, wait, what? <laughs> and he, he says, yeah, if you want to have control of the gate, sure. She goes, okay, sure, I gotta make a stop first. I thought she was going to try to... I really thought she was going to try to do something stupid with the time travel. I really thought that she was going to, like, go back to when she and Adam were first born and stop Skeletor. And, like, I don't I think really, that. I was really expecting something, like, like out-of-control, time-altering stupid to happen. And <laughs> the only thing that happened was... Poor Modulok. Is he demoted to the hood or the horde cook again? Because essentially, <laughs> that whole scene was hilarious. I thought that was great. Yeah, I mean, I I thought she was going to do something. I thought she was going to go and say hi to Adam or say hi to He Man on her way back or say yeah. something about Grandamir or maybe even visit Grandamir. I thought there was going to be something, except yeah. I didn't expect her to go straight back to the fight yeah. zone. Uh, uh, for me for a rating, uh, four and a half easily. And uh, and this is what happens when you mess with time travel and uh, <laughs> and space and time all at the same time is the the all the universes implode on each other because I'm giving this one a four and a half as well. So four and a half, a good. Well, we had nothing negative to say about yeah. it. I mean, <laughs> I mean, we didn't we didn't rant and rave about it. We didn't have like a billion whispering words, yeah. about it, but it's just overall, it's a solid episode. It's good. It's you know, we... yeah. And I, I I hate to keep 
ramming down this to everyone's throat like Ram Man would, but really, sir, if He Man was here, it would have made it a five. That's really the only reason why I gave it a four and a half. It's because I thought He Man was going to be here and he wasn't. Uh, I'm glad and I'm fine that he isn't here with the way that the story panned out. I thought it was great, but that's the pretty much the only reason why it's not a five is because that He Man's not here. It's still four four and a half is still a damn good rating to the whole thing. Yeah, and that's what I'm saying. It was just missing that one extra oomph of something special for me to give it a five. I yeah. thought about it, but uh, right now it's sitting at a four and a half, which is still pretty darn good in this series. So we'll have to see if the good vibes continue as we take a break and come back to talk about those magic cats. tell you how much I appreciate your meeting me here, Prince Orwell. If Hordak ever found out that you were giving supplies to the Rebellion, the risk you're taking... The risk is worth it, Adora. My father and I hate the Horde's rule. Our only regret is that we cannot give more to the Rebellion. But, as you know, the Horde is keeping a constant watch on our little kingdom. These tiny wagons are all that we are able to sneak past their guard. I realize that, Orwell. But we're still grateful for the supplies you do manage to get to us. Wow! Our spies were right. Adora is here with Prince Orwell. We'll take them both. And because a lot of people fleeing the Horde come to us, we need food, medicine, clothes. Then you shall have them as much as you need. Now! Get them! Ambush! Stormcloud, wait! Over here! We can't afford to let them catch you. Take spirit. Head back to the kingdom. But what about you? Please, just go. I can take care of myself. <laughs> you want me? Come and get me. That head should keep me out of sight long enough to do this. as good as Hordak's trap. Wherever this leads, I hope they don't mind guests dropping in. Next up today is episode 62, Magic Hats. Air date Monday, December 2nd, 1985. Again, written by J. Michael Straczynski. And this is just basically all about Katra, who pretends to be the queen of the Magic Hats after Katra and she fall into a bottomless pit that ends up uh, I guess it's not bottomless but they fall, fall into a chasm that leads them into the maze and the land of the magic hats so we get uh, introduced to a whole other subspecies I guess of Ethereans with the magic hats and their missing queen what did you think about this one at first I thought this was just going to be a standard stupid horde catra episode and then it got really interesting with the introduction of the maze thing and, and the magic hats and everything else. And I thought it was really, really cool. What I liked about this was normally when we have plots like this where the horde gets to the people first, they completely turn them, like completely 180 turn them against whatever positive, like Shira, whatever positive is going to come in. And I like that they didn't really write... I mean, again, it's J. J. Michael Straczynski, if I can talk. Uh, you know, so I, I, I didn't think he would do that, but some writers have done that in the past where, 
you look at any warring factions that are Eternia or Etheria, you know, this side, that side, no one wants to believe the other person, blah, blah, blah. I'm glad in this that they had at least one character in uh, in Percival that actually listened to She-Ra uh, to be able to do it. But I know, I thought this was great. I thought it was great. You know, I'll say, you know, later in, in, in the, I was called the Castle Grayskull moments, or Whispering Woods moments, um, about essentially this is a story of, this is almost Catcher's origin story, pretty much. Uh, yeah. Probably the best origin story for her in this show that we're going to get. So yeah, I really was digging on it. Uh, what about you? I enjoyed the kind of look into the underworld of Etheria, and I liked the design on these magic cats. So it reminded me of something that we would have saw in like Thundercats or something here. Um, but uh, Thundercats meet magic cats. But I, yeah, I, I like the idea that this is somewhat of a backstory not just to this subspecies uh, or whatever you want to call them but also to Katra and kind of how that all played out so uh, I found it very interesting I, I think J. Michael Straczynski added some some nice touches to these last couple episodes so I'm a, I'm a fan absolutely all right well we're going to take a quick break then and come back with some specific things that we liked and maybe a couple that we didn't like about Magic Cats just got to a long talk on working together in peace and ending with the hope that someday our beloved queen will return to us. Hmm, interesting. The city of cats. Just the place to slip through unnoticed. All right, we're back in the Whispering Woods to talk about what we like best about the Magic Cats. I will go first since you went first last time here. Um, mm. I, I like the moments where the, the moment where the cats always land on all fours as she's falling through the chasm. Uh, mm -hmm. She turns into her cat form, and we all know cats always land on their feet. So um, I liked all the cats. Uh, I liked the idea that there's a history behind the mask that Catra wears. That makes more sense than to why she always has it, etc. And we also got to see Catra with no mask in this episode um, on multiple occasions. So I thought that was interesting. Also, for the record, first time, I think, in Princess of Power history where we have a trap door that does not work. <laughs> We're going to see it again. We're going to see it I'm again just... in this, uh, still in this podcast episode, but uh, we had we had one time where she it gets, they push the button oh. and she was supposed to go down oh, the trap door. And yeah. she... I, I, almost, I almost jumped ahead yeah. on you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, okay, but it's She-Ra, though. Right, okay, first time that it hasn't worked for just any individual person. We're going to get a different first right. in next episode, but this time she -Ra blocks it with her sword and, and right. is able to save it. But, yeah, I mean, it's She-Ra. I, I, I would expect that from her, that she would be able to do something like that. After all, she's not four-eyed. Yeah. Um, what about you? Uh, okay, so at first I thought I was going to be really down on this episode. Like, like I was ready to give this a zero immediately. Because uh, it seems to just start out as a standard catcher plot. Most catcher plots don't go very far. Um, but then it actually turns around and, and it actually turns into a really nice story. So I love that uh, pacing done well. Uh, getting background on Catra and her mask is great. I thought that was wonderful. Um, so technically... Without the mask, I mean, Catra is just the evil twin of She-Ra. I mean, really seriously. 
Because without the mask, without her powers, she really is ordinary. Right. I mean, you know. Uh, and, you know, I, I, I joked about this last time in uh, in episode 66 at the end of the show when we revealed the episodes. I, I said, and I still say, this reminds me of the Aristocats. Too bad there's no singing here. Oh, cat, cat. <laughs> That's what they were missing. What about yeah. uh, what about any fright zone moments for you? The only thing that I didn't like. How the hell did Catcher not hear Percival talking to the audience first, Bueller style, when he was spying on her? <laughs> like they consistently show her and show him peeking in the wind. How does she not hear the guy? <laughs> She's a good damn cat. She's a damn cat. Cats have excellent hearing. How does she not hear that? Yeah. That's really I, the only thing. I didn't pick what up on you? that. That's a good one. Uh, I, yeah. Shira just doesn't play fair. I mean, it's a maze. Uh, you're not <laughs> supposed to just bust through all the walls. like. But she's Shira. She's the most powerful woman in the universe. She doesn't have to play fair. It's not like she's... I could see if she was killing people. Not that, the, not that she would, not that they'd allow that, but, you know. It's such a villain move, though. It's such a, a villain move to be like, I'm frustrated with this maze. I'm just busting the walls down. I expect my heroes to figure out the maze. And to be yeah. smarter, or to like fly above it or something. I don't know, but uh, yeah, she wasn't playing. Fair. Okay, okay, but she couldn't. How, how's she gonna fly above? I have no it? idea how she would pull that off. What you know, sword to hang glider? Uh, probably, yeah, sword to anything. <laughs> sword to parachute. <laughs> sword to hot air balloon. That was the other funny thing to me. Uh, before we get to, oh, we're kind of already in uh, fright zone, but that was the other kind of funny thing to me. Going back to Whispering Woods is. Swifty is not with her, so when she falls down the chasm, and it basically has her midair, just how am I gonna slow my? You know, all, I'm like, well, if your horse was with you, if your unicorn was with you, you wouldn't have this problem. <laughs> yeah, for sure. <laughs> this is the PSA, PSA for this. It's about not littering. Okay, let's move on. Because <laughs> that makes no goddamn sense. The plot of this story. Absolutely not. Yeah. No. Your Highness, you have returned. All right, fun's fun. I like puzzles, but this one's no fun. From now on, I'm going in a straight line. There she was, the queen. It was as though she appeared out of nowhere, Minister Cloudfoot. Hmm, yes. She does look like the queen, even down to the mask. But we must be certain. Oh, if they think I'm their queen, this could be my big chance. Hmm, do you remember anything before you were found at the entrance? No, I can't remember a thing. Then perhaps this will help jog your memory. When the horde came from the sky in their terrible machines, we ran to hide here in half moon. Everywhere, prisoners were taken. Knowing that some of our missing people were being held captive, our queen left to search for them. And that was the last we saw of her. Hmm. That would be about the same time Hordak gave me this mask. It must have belonged to their queen. Does any of this help bring back your memories? Yes. Yes, it does. Good. Then you will not mind submitting to a test. The queen's mask was very much like your own, but hers had magic properties. She'd get most of its powers secret, but I do know of one. She would say, freeze fire, and a ray would come from the mask to freeze whatever she was looking at. Can your mask do that? Oh, I guess I have to show these fools. Of course it does. Freeze! Whiskers and says it worked. Oh, it did? Oh, oh, of course it did. I am your queen. Then it's true. 
Only the Queen's mask would respond to that command. The Queen has returned. We must have a coronation. We must... Mr. Cloudfoot! All right, we're back for our award ceremony for the Magic Hats. What did you feel as far as worthiness for protection swords or horde bats in this one? I got to give a horde bat upside the head to Catra for not hearing Percival outside her window. All right. That just... She's a damn cat. Cats have excellent... I already said this. Cats have excellent hearing. There's no way she wouldn't have heard him. (laughs) Uh, protection swords to Shira and Percival. Uh, Shira, just because she was so great in the episode, I know you're probably going to give her a horde bat for knocking through the walls and <laughs> cheating. But actually, but, no, I'm, I'm right there with you. I'm giving her a protection sword as well. Okay, so she did also, fall for the uh, fall for the trap door. Yeah, no. Uh, also to Percival because he actually did listen, and he, you know, the way the story has, the way Straczynski wrote the story, and the way he you know, crafted the characters, uh, th- these new characters that we're seeing is just absolutely amazing. So, yeah. Yeah, and I'm with you with Shira. I think she was great in this episode outside of, I was just surprised that she just busted down the walls in the maze. But outside of that, I thought she was real good. But I, I don't feel negative about anybody enough to give them a, a horde bat. So I'm just giving the one protection sword. Yep. As for ratings for me, I got to say, this episode, we didn't really talk yet a lot about the, I mean, you talked a little bit about the idea that Katra was given to the, you know, without the mask, she's somewhat normal, and we get to see the history of that it, the mask belonged to somebody else, you know, that it belonged to these magic hats, and that um, that basically she was given the mask by Hordak, and that's where all her power comes from. So, I mean, it's a lot of interesting backstory there for that character that makes things uh, a little bit more complex. And yeah. Also, we didn't talk about the fact that the magic hats have the men in black uh, tool to just erase memories. So that comes in handy. Yeah, I um, I wasn't going to go neuralizing people on that one. <laughs> but I, I overall enjoyed the episode much more than I thought I was going to. I'm going to give this one a four out of five. Ladies and gentlemen, the world is about to break four out of five. <laughs> Jesus, what is going on right now? I know. All right, well, two for two. We've agreed on two episodes in a row, which is why we're flying through this episode. Uh, and up next, we have flowers for Algernon. Flowers for Hordak. Let's see if the agreement will continue or end here. Okay, say that last line. <laughs> uh, what did I say? Uh, agreement will continue or end. We're going to have to see if the agreement will continue or end with episode 63 coming up next, Flowers for Hordak. one of the ancient monuments. It is a powerful weapon. Really? Does it explode? No. Hmm. What good is it then? If you will let me explain, this ruby will greatly increase my shadow powers. Wonderful. Hmm. One moment, Shadow Weaver. Mantana, get in here now. Then perhaps you can explain that. Mm, do you like it, Great Hordak? I stole it from an old woman yesterday and put it there for you. It's very pretty. Oh, thank you, Master. So I hate it. I hate pretty. I can't stand beauty. Nothing in the Fright Zone should ever be beautiful. <laughs> Sorry, Majestic One. Sorry? I'll give you sorry. Why are you dripping water on my floor? I was in the shower when you called, oh, murmur, merciful Hordak. Shower? You don't need a shower. I don't? No, you need a bath. Bungler knows I hate everything that is beautiful. Go on with what you are saying, Shadow Weaver. Oh, thank you. With this black ruby, my powers are much greater. I 
we'll be able to darken the air over all the Whispering Woods. So what? The rebels are not afraid of the dark. Ah, but without the sun, plants will not grow. The magic trees of the Whispering Woods will grow weak. And without the protection of the Whispering Woods, the rebels will be helpless. We shall conquer them easily. A brilliant plan. Truly, I am a genius. Of course, brilliant, Tordak. And naturally, your genius has spotted the one flaw in your plan. Flaw? There is no flaw. Not even she can fight darkness. I refer to the rebel Perfuma, Great Hordak. Her powers can make plants grow even in darkness. Naturally. I had thought of that, Shadow Weaver. Ah, naturally. But this Perfuma will be no threat to my plan. If she is in the dungeons of the Fright Zone, get me a strike force. I want Perfuma captured. Last up today is episode 63, Flowers for Hordak. Air date of Tuesday, December 3rd, 1985. Not written by J. Michael Straczynski. Instead, this one's written by Bob Forward. Shadow Weaver uses the Black Ruby to darken the Whispering Woods. Hordak has Perfuma captured, so she can't keep the flowers and trees alive and counter the effects of the Black Ruby. But while the rebels struggle to save their surroundings, Hordak finds it difficult coping with Perfuma. In the Fright Zone, we have Hordak, Shadow Weaver, Mantena, we have She-Ra, Light Hope, Bo, Mermista, Glimmer, Perfuma. Got a lot of people going on here. So what did you think about this Perfuma-centric episode? So we've been joking between this episode and the last episode about flowers for Algernon. For most of you that may not know what that is, it was an original short story and a novel. It also got turned into several films and stage musicals and, and, and things like that. Um, I think probably, you can probably argue this or not, um, the most the two most iconic versions of it are the 68 film Charlie, uh, starring Cliff Robertson, for which he won the Academy Award for Best Actor, and the 2000 version television movie Flowers for Algernon, starring Matthew Modine. Um, but I remember having to deal with this in English class several hmm. times throughout middle school and high school and that kind of stuff. And as soon as I heard the title, uh, you know, Fl and I, Flowers for Algernon is written by Daniel Keyes, just so I get that out of there. Uh, so I give credit where credit is due. But yeah, Flowers for Hordak. Even though this is not a Straczynski episode, finally, Bob Forward goes back to what we know him for awesomeness because holy shit this entire episode is great <laughs> so you're a big fan of the of, of the whole perfuma character and and what happens with her she's a little annoying but she's not as horrible as lukey um at least her powers have purpose other you know who the hell cares if somebody's hiding in the woods unless he's going to jump out at you and scare the crap out of you? Nobody cares, Luki. Um, but, yeah, no, I mean, I liked it. I thought it was cool. Uh, we, we don't really get a... Because this is technically a Perfuma... Or, I don't want to say origin, but it's a Perfuma... Fuck. <laughs> it's a Perfuma-centric story. Um, we get a little bit of Mermista here, but not much, which I think was kind of cool. Uh, I love the talk about it later but uh, the one scene get these junk heaps out of my pool right <laughs> uh, i mean i'm a big fan of the idea of us getting a, an episode based on one of the other characters that we haven't seen too much you know whether it be frosta or mermista perfuma whatever mm -hmm. i like any episode that's going to feature one of those characters that we haven't got a lot of i'm a big yeah. fan of so from as far as a plot standpoint i'm on board with this one so oh yeah all right. Absolutely. Well, we'll take a quick break and be back with what specifically we liked and what we found maybe Fright Zone worthy as far as the flowers for Hordak go. What a beautiful day. You were right, Bo. A trip to Crystal Falls was just what I needed. Glad to hear you say it, Adora. You were pretty hard to convince. It's just that I feel guilty about relaxing. No one can work all the time, Adora. A little rest will do you good. Hey! No... <laughs> A 
As you can see, Bo, the water's fine. Come on in. I'll race you. <laughs> no thanks, Mermista. I know better than to swim against someone who has fins. It's been a long time since I was here, Mermista, but Crystal Falls seems more beautiful than ever. That's because Perfuma's visiting me. She's been decorating. You know how she is? Perfuma's here? Over there. Decorating as usual. Now that's what I call away with plants. Perfuma! Over here! Mermist has been kind enough to let me add a few flowers to the Crystal Falls. As if anyone could stop you. Oh, I think flowers make everything look so much nicer. Don't you, Adora? Uh, of course, Perfuma. But aren't you worried being so far from the safety of Whispering Woods? Why, don't be silly, Adora. What could possibly happen here? Either the birds here are rocket-powered, or... Or that's a horde strike force! Scatter! All right, so uh, we are in the Whispering Woods for the final time today, talking about this Flowers for Hordak episode. What did you like best about this episode, sir? Love seeing Marmista and Perfuma. Love seeing more of the female characters that we've been dying to see all season at this point. Uh, love everything that both of them do. More, more missed a little bit more than, than Perfuma, because Perfuma does kind of wear on you. She's not as bad as any other female character. Like, I didn't find Perfuma bad at all, but it, I don't know, just after a while, the joke kind of wore off on me. Uh, at first, I thought, again, the plot was going to be just okay there, and then it gets funnier and funnier and funnier. Uh, flowers for Hordak, indeed. Uh, and then Hordak makes the best bargain to get rid of her. <laughs> I thought that was hilarious. Like, he's basically throwing everything except the kitchen sink in, the, in this bargain. I thought that was hilarious. Um, I love the effects with Perfuma and Mermista. Uh, I already mentioned the whole Mermista throwing the, hor the, the, the dented Horde troopers out of her pool. I thought that was cool. Um, what about you? I, I did like seeing Mermista and Perfuma, so that was a much awaited. I've been anticipating this episode quite a bit. Um, but? Well, we'll get to the but. Um, <laughs> I like seeing that Glimmer apparently has a power that we never knew that she had directly related to her name. Did yes. you know she could do that? Um, no. She can but... basically turn into like a star or like a sun and Glimmer for up to an hour a day and provide light for everything. Yeah. I didn't know that, so I thought it was kind of cool to see that there was a purpose. Because everybody else, it's like, okay, I get why she's named Mermista. I get why she's named Perfuma, Frosta, etc. Why the hell is this girl named Glimmer? Now we know. So I guess that question has been answered finally in 63 episodes. Uh, Hordak is crazy. <laughs> Hordak, crazy Hordak is crazy. You know, awesome. It, it, not just crazy because of Perfuma. He's crazy before that in this episode. He's talking to shadow weaver about this plot and it's just like it's like the squirrel video um all of a sudden he's calling freaking mantena in to just go off on some random tangent about this like statue that's over in this it's like he just saw it and was like oh stop shadow weaver i'm not concerned with you I forgot about mantena in the bathrobe or the towel oh we god to get mantena uh mantena with no clothes on in this episode by the uh, way yeah, I, I didn't realize his skin was blue. Yeah, I didn't either. And then my last moment for Whispering Woods is, like we said in the last episode, last episode might have been the first time the trapdoor didn't work in general. This is the first time the trapdoor did not work for Mantena, and it is full of flowers. I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm sure he was happy. About, well, see, that's the thing. Hordak's like, you know, the troopers are like, oh, Hordak, we put them. I, I don't want to know. Just don't even tell me. I don't care. Right. And then he comes in to do his favorite thing, dropping Mantana down the trap. Well, well, Lord Hordak, this is where we had to put them. And it just drives him even more insane. And it's just so hilarious. 
Bob Forward should write Hordak comedy for the rest of his life. There we go. I don't think he would want to do that, though. Um, what about Fright Zone moments? I don't care. Put him in a jar, and you know, it's it's, it's like that old it's like that old standard. Put Peter Cullen on ice, or put Peter and Frank on ice to have their voices forever. I again have no Fright Zone moments. That I loved everything about this. Like I said in the plot part, Perfuma does kind of get a little annoying a little bit, but she doesn't get so annoying that I wanted to write anything down about it. I still. Hordikins. Oh, God. and then when Shira calls him Hordikins, oh my God! I guess that's going to be the difference between you and me because uh, oh. there was enough for me to write something about Perfuma. Uh oh. Uh, All right. What do you get? Man, I don't. I was. I can't help but think that as much as I'm anticipating finally seeing all these characters that we haven't seen before, I felt disappointed with Perfuma. Um, I think had someone else done the voice it might have not graded on me so much. Wasn't it Erica? Or yeah, was it Linda? It's, it's Erica. And, oh, my goodness, I just found it awful. Um, See, I didn't find it as awful as you did because it wasn't the... Like, to me, it didn't sound like the standard Erica Scheimer voice. No, she does a little of something to it. It's a little different, but yeah. it just is so grating on me, and I found her character so annoying, so annoying. But I get that that's the point. It's, she's supposed yeah. to be annoying. She's supposed to be like that, but it's just like, I can't help but write her down as a bright zone moment because I was not expecting her to be so annoying. <laughs> so um, it didn't ruin the episode so much, but, I mean, basically she's a one-trick pony. She's just dancing and putting flowers on everything. Um, yeah. I thought it was cool when she did the flowers to get out of the jail cell and that type of thing. Yeah. But, man, it was just a bit much. Damn, that voice. Uh, the PSA was about enjoying the flowers and nature. Uh, see, I didn't even... I As soon as I saw where... Because I, I never find... It's very rare, and I've brought this up before. It, I think it's... And I don't know if you've ever written this down, but I think it's maybe three times so far in season one out of all these episodes that I've found Lukey. So I really just don't even look for him, but this one, I didn't even care. I was on such a high of of enjoying the episode that I saw where he's like, hey, did you find me today? And I actually saw him where he asks us, did, did, you know, and I'm like, yeah, you're right there. Goodbye. <laughs> I didn't even watch the PS. I didn't even care because the episode was so good for me that I didn't want Lukey to bring it down with some stupidity that he normally spits out of his mouth. Fair enough. All right. Well, we're going to take our final break, and when we come back, we'll be back for the hardware and the ratings and see if we go three for three with our agreement on these episodes or not. The rebel Perfuma has been captured by the Order. Excellent, Trooper. With Perfuma in a Trooper. How dare you come before me looking like that? It's it's not my fault, mighty one. The prisoner... No excuses. You know I hate flowers more than anything. They're too pretty. Guards! Yes, oh great one. Make sure that the prisoner Perfuma is placed in the darkest, dankest, dampest, dismalest dungeon we have. Yes, mighty Hordak. I shall visit there later in order to gloat. Are you ready to cast a spell of darkness, Weaver? I am, oh Hordak. Then let it be done. And then the trooper kidnapped Perfuma before we could stop him. But why would the Horde want Perfuma? I don't know, Glimmer. But I think we're finding out now. It must be Shadow Weaver's evil magic. Darkness? It's annoying, but it won't hurt us. It isn't us we have to worry about, Bo. It's the trees. The magic trees of the Whispering Woods are what protect us from the Horde. If the trees get no sun, they will wither and grow weak, leaving us helpless before the Horde. So now we know why the Horde kidnapped Perfuma. Yes, Bo. Perfuma's powers would have kept the trees strong even in darkness, but without her. What are we going to do? I don't know, but I know just whom to ask. Shadow Weaver now possesses the Black Ruby, Shiva. And with it, her powers are strong enough to keep the woods dark for months. But the trees will not survive months of darkness. Do not despair, Shiva. You will find a way. But what about Perfuma? I have to rescue her. No, Shiva. You are needed in the woods. 
Do nothing about Perfuma. Nothing? But Light Hope, surely I must rescue Perfuma. No, Shima. My magic says you should do nothing. Nothing at all. One more chance to hand out horde bats and protection swords. What do you have for us, sir? No horde bats, but um, protection swords for everybody. I just everybody, absolutely huh? everybody, especially Hordak. <laughs> Hordak needs to get like you know a baker's dozen of protection swords here because oh my god, the only okay. So all right, I will I will be giving a horde bat, and this is going to sound really weird, and I know you're going to probably. Uh, is it just me, or did Desenzo's voice for Hordak, has it changed? Because these three episodes today, when I've heard Hordak, if he's been in the episodes, hmm. it sounds like, it, it, it's Desenzo, I know it's his Hordak voice, but it just it just sounds a lot different than, like, say, something like Secret of the Sword. It I don't know if it changed or anything else, or what what's going on there, but... Um, uh, because it did change a little, at least in my, at least I heard it change. I'll give Desenzo a horde bat, but everybody else gets protection swords because the comedy in this episode was just so great. All right. Well, I just have a whole one horde bat to give out, and that's going to be to Perfuma. She was too much for me. I don't want to see her that much. I'm, I'm glad that we haven't seen her too much for the 63 <laughs> episodes. I would like to see Mermista, though, again, because yes. I did not get enough of her. Yeah. I, I think you're way higher on this episode than I'm going to be, so uh, what's the Crystal Castle rating for you? Glass ceiling shatters with a five. Do you really it, think this is better than the other two episodes? I had so much fun with this that, yeah. Well, I'm glad I, you enjoyed it. I'm glad you enjoyed I, it. I, well, okay, but it's not because of Perfuma that I had fun. It's because of what she's doing and it's more so because of Hordak's reaction that I had so much fun. I had fun with all three of these today. But, yeah, I mean, the the Catra episode, look, okay, so looking back on it, really, Magic Cats, it was, it was alright, and like I said, if He-Man had shown up in, in Dark Smoke and Fire, it would have gotten a five, so I would have had two fives out of, out of three here. So, yeah, absolutely love Flowers for Hordak. This is an episode I could watch again easily, just to just to see Hordak and how distraught and how crazy he, he turns out I mean, to I, be. I agree, that is fun, but it, it just seems like that's all we get for 20 minutes. So I <laughs> I just can't go as high as you. I'm, I'm three and a half out of five on this one. Um, I preferred the other two episodes. I thought Magic Cat gave us some cool backstory to Catra, as well as the whole Magic Cat people were interesting. I thought going back in time and seeing Granimir was more interesting. This one, we do get to see Perfume and what she's all about, and that's all I need about her. So <laughs> I can only give this one a three and a half. So. so the only other one we have left to see is Flutterina, right? Um, I don't know if Pika Blue shows up in the series or not. Okay. That's a character that there was a toy on, but I don't, I don't have yeah. no idea. So we'll have to wait and see what comes uh, for us in the second season, so to speak, I guess, of this. So... We'll take one final break, and when we'll be back, we'll close this episode out. Well, I, I suppose there's something we can do about that. We have plenty of food here in Dragon Valley, more than enough to feed us and your people. You may take whatever you need. Thank you. Thank you, Granamir. We will tell our people of your kindness. See that you do. Now you must go. As for you, Shira, I give you my thanks and a way home. I cannot send you across space and time, but together with the magic of your sword, we might find a way. It's worth a try. Tarbin, thank you for all your help. I'll never forget these two days. I regret only that you must leave so soon. Perhaps we will meet again. Perhaps. And now, Shira, we dragons have a saying. Here goes nothing. We have a saying also. For the honor of Grayskull! That's got it. Granamir, will I be able to control the gateway? If you wish, what? There's a stop I'd like to make before getting home. Thanks again, and goodbye. Oh, I like 
watch her. Too bad I'll never see her again. I thought you would feel that way. So, I have something for you. This is a piece of Nazgul's crystal. I have placed a small amount of my own power into it. Take it. Thank you, Granamir. It will give you certain powers and allow you from time to time to see how your new friend is getting along. Two days and still no sign of Shira. Your invention worked, Modular. Give me the plans. I will have a whole fleet of them made up. All right, Hordak. But be careful. This is my only copy of the plans for the rocket. Thanks. You're welcome. What? Bye. It's all your fault. Shira, you're back. You were gone so long, it seemed like forever. Oh, not quite forever, Spirit. Just a thousand years. A what? It's a long story, Spirit. A long story. <laughs> Magic Cat's wearing hammer pants. It's MC Hammer Cats. Because the world needs another movie podcast. The Geek Cast Radio Network presents for your listening pleasure, The Cinema Geek. Hosted by Amanda, Kevin, Matt, and Dan. Each week we dive headfirst in the landscape of movies as we discuss movie news, play movie games, go in-depth on reviews, and even have a top ten countdown or two. Also, don't miss our director retrospective series where we review noted director's movies film by film. Bottom line is, if you love movies and love podcasts, you need to experience The Cinema Geek. You can find us on iTunes, Blog Talk Radio, or GeekCastRadio.com. All right, folks, that's going to do it for us here on Myths of Etheria, episode 67. This is the Shira season one penultimate episode. Next time around, we're going to recap season one and talk about the final two episodes. Uh, what um, At this point, what are you expecting out of the final two episodes? Well, I mean, I've already peeked ahead, so uh, right. I know who's going to be in the cast, so I... I there's a little to look forward in both episodes, I'll say that much. But uh, I don't know if I'm really expecting too much. I'm just... Uh, I've liked the latter half of season one. I've liked... Or maybe the latter third of it a lot. I think that we had some some slow moments kind of midway through the season. I think it somewhat has picked up with some interesting stories along the way. So I'm hoping we get two more interesting, you know, four, four and a half, five star ratings for these last All two right, episodes. Good. Yeah, there were some episodes there in the middle. I think it was episodes either 59 or 60 or the, of the podcast where it was just kind of like, eh, whatever. We could do, we, we, we deserve better. <laughs> um, but yeah, no, I'm very much looking forward to seeing how season one ends uh, and then starting season two. Uh, so thank you for listening to the Myths of Etheria. If you'd like to get in contact with us to leave feedback for the show, there's some ways to do so. You can visit the website, geekcastradio.com, which is all new, so come check us out. We can comment on this and all of our other episode posts. Leave the show's feedback in iTunes. Please do this. Follow us on Twitter, at Geekcast Radio is the network Twitter. Pow of Grayskull is the show Twitter. Mine is TFG and Mike. What is your Twitter? Optimus Solo. You can send us email feedback to feedback at geekcastradio.com. Become a fan on Facebook. Go to facebook.com slash geekcast radio network. We hope you enjoyed the myths today, and don't forget to join us on our next adventure when we will take a look at the final two episodes of season one of Shira, which are Wild Child. Oh no, somebody call Mo. Uh, 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 what's his name? Sheen from Major League. <laughs> Vaughn. Yeah. Uh, and episode 65, The Greatest Magic. We'll also be giving you our Season 1 recap. So that's going to be an extra special episode, folks. You get two episode reviews 
plus an entire season one recap with countdowns and favorites and least favorites and cord bats and sword protection rankings and whatever other math Kevin's or whatever other meth Kevin wants to do. <laughs> Anything you want to say before I close it? No, um, just uh, interested to see how season one ends up here, the the long season one, and then uh, see where season two takes us. Sometimes you get to season two and you get new characters or new storylines or whatnot. I don't know. Season two only has 28 episodes. Right, so. it's not very long, so we'll have to, I'm interested to see yeah. how it plays out. Yep. For now, I am TFG and Mike with... Optimus Solo. For the honor and by the power of Grayskull, you all have the power. Damn, I did that backwards. Kid? Yes. Shut up. Beyond the Night is the GCRN's latest review podcast. We are covering everything in the Knight Rider television universe. From the classic 80s TV series to the 1991 reunion film, Team Knight Rider, ugh, and the 2008 relaunch series as well. So join TFG and Mike and Dion the Music Man as they go in-depth in Beyond the Night only on GeekCast Radio Network. You can find Beyond the Night in iTunes and on www.geekcastradio.com. Yes, Michael. Just keep driving. I know, see you next time.